Hi, Nico. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much for having me. It's wonderful to uh, have the roles reverse and be on your show. I know. So my Love Bites fam, I was on Nico's show, I think like last month or maybe a couple months ago. And I will uh, tag that episode as well. So definitely please go listen to that episode. I had so much fun talking with Nico and uh, his show is amazing. And it is titled, what is it, Nico? Starve the Ego, Feed the Soul. Thanks yes, like I said in the introduction. So we're, today we're really talking about, we're doing a deep dive into the ego in the bedroom. And I will also be like sharing from my perspective, you know, as a woman and like how I feel about it. But I also want to hear from you, you know, as a coach, as a man with, you know, experiences with some like sex and commitment issues in the past and yep. like now where you are and what you think the ego is doing in the bedroom, mainly, mainly like destroying people's good sex life. Right. So let's, totally. let's get to it. Let's talk about that. The ego in the bedroom. Let's do it. So I think that, you know, for speaking from the male perspective, um, and, and I'm going to speak from the Western culture perspective, because that's where I grew up in. Right. And specifically, I grew up in a Hispanic family, um, but in a very diverse population with with white folks, black folks, native folks. You know, where are you folks. from? So I grew up in the Southwest Barrios in Tucson, Arizona. OK, um, so it's the west side of town. Um, and yeah, if anyone knows Tucson, shout out to Tucson High. That's my alma mater for high school. <laughs> um, love that place. But yeah, I think, you know as a young man, you, you, you grow up and when you, when you're young, you know, rarely, at least, you know, traditionally, are you ever spoken to about sex besides maybe using protection and maybe a little bit of talk about STDs, right. And maybe a tiny bit of talk about consent, if your parents think about it. Right. And, and I'm speaking from being a, a, an eighties baby. Right. And things are certainly changing. Um, and then, you know, you grow up and, you know, you start to be attracted to whatever sex, whatever genders you're attracted to. You. And as you get older from the male perspective, I think it, what happens is young men, young boys start to, you know, start to get like braggadocious about, you know, what, what women they're attracted to, what women they're, you know, they kiss or they're flirting with, let's say, or they're sleeping with when you get to the point of actually having intercourse. Right. And the focus is really on achievement or on sort of uh, dominance, but not dominance in like the healthy, you know, no, not, way the we're no fun not the BDSM. Dominance. Dominance. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's just like, well, like how many, how many, like, you know, can I, how many like people can I conquer in a way? How many people right. can I sleep with? Right. Um, and I think that that issue is twofold because every man is raised by a woman that to some extent, or at least comes out of a woman. Right. And, and depending on your parental situation, it could be so many different ways, but I think the ego around sex really sort of grows with us, right. As we start to become more attached to productivity in Western culture, to social status, to accomplishment, to having a really, really physically attractive mate. So we can walk around and sort of showcase them off. Like, look at me. I'm, I'm trophy incredible. wife or trophy, trophy husband. wife, trophy husband. Exactly. That terminology. Right. And, and because of this, we, we remain really unconscious about what our sex life is doing for us and is doing for the other. Mm -hmm. Right. And so young men are usually taught at a very young age, somehow either by their friends or by their sports groups or by whatever, you know, um, whatever social circles they're in is that, well, you should be sort of good enough as you are. And you should be able to satisfy like all a woman's need, all a woman's needs just basically with your own body. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think over history, that certainly has been our only option because we didn't have right. batteries and vibrators <laughs> and all these exactly. other fucking things to strap someone on the top of a roof. Right. But, you know, people have been doing freaky stuff since humans were invented, you know? Oh, yeah. And, there's uh, temples and I think Nepal or India where oh, yeah. old, old, like 3000 years old, something yep. paintings of uh, orgies. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and And the thing about that is, you know, for some cultures, there wasn't too much shame around it, but there wasn't too much shame in the masculine. So meaning like women were still, you know, a lot of shame were was dumped right. on them, right? right. And then, and, but if we talk about like the oldest profession in, in the world, we, we talk about like prostitution or selling uh -huh. your body for money, right? So uh -huh. there's all these interesting dualities happening. But from the male perspective, you know, in my opinion, it's always been like, you know, how, like how many really beautiful women can I sleep with, right? And for me, uh, and I can speak to this, I've slept with, you know, probably over a hundred women, 120 women, you know, and for me, that's a, that's quite a high number. I know friends that of mine that are musicians, touring musicians that have slept with way more people than Did that. Did you say and musicians? Like, yeah. You know, just like <laughs> musicians. Specifically athletes. musicians. 
<laughs> well, you know, let's be honest. When you're on tour, you know, a lot of musicians, they just, they never get relationships. It's really hard. I'm not throwing musicians under the bus. But I'm just using them as an example. Okay, let's, uh, let's pause for a moment there and like take a deep breath. And I want to share something. Cool. Like the fact that you said that you had sex with hundred something people, I bet that are, there are listeners that are like, dude, awesome. High five. Yep. As soon as I say I have slept, me, Dr. Tara, woman, Asian, young, have slept with more than a hundred men. For example, if I say that, then I'm a fucking witch. Yeah. Like my vagina is probably so loose and I'm so unwanted and so like tossed over that like no one would want me, right? Like, I mean, this this is a, a little bit of a graphic language, but really what people are thinking of, like what a slut. Yep. So that yep. like double standard is so, so, so toxic because whenever women talk about their own sexual exploration, it's never perceived out of, as a positive thing, yeah. uh, except for yeah. your like little friend group that are really supportive, right? right. Like we right. do high fives when like, we had dick girl, appointments. Like, yeah, yeah, we're like, totally. oh my God, I just came from a dick appointment. It was amazing. <laughs> high five. But like for men, it's like, oh, such, an, such, such as an achievement. Wow, you've had sex with hundred something people. It's like- so like, you know, because, because you're attractive, because you you have a great body, because you right. great at picking up girls, right? It's all these things. It's so unfair, but yeah. yes, please continue. <laughs> and I think as, as you know, um, it's, it's very rooted in patriarchy, right? In, mm -hmm. in sort of an unhealthy masculinity, but I do think there are some shadow feminine things that also play into that dynamic, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's, it's all these energetics at play. Um, but we do live in a patriarchal society. So we have to sort of honor that and understand that that is a huge contributing factor to that. Right. Um, so I, I sort of debated whether even to like name a number when I came on the show and I was like, no, I do want to be honest. You know, this is the first time in public, I've yes, told a bunch I of friends, this, but, this. but mostly because I want to talk about the unhealthy part of losing yourself in sex. Right. And I think that directly mm. relates to this ego. Okay. So, um, I think for me, you know, addiction, we talk about it a lot, um, in society, but we really only talk about the way it manifests within, you know, drug or alcohol abuse. Right. And we talk about sex abuse a little bit, but then there's a lot of like sexual health, sexual promotion stuff. Like, Hey, like have a lot of sex, like, sex is good for you. Like, you know, do this. And I think the delineating factor, I work with a lot of clients around this as well too, is, is it making you feel better? Is it contributing to the embodiment, the empowerment and the health of your life? Or is it taking away from it? Right. Um, in a lot of my twenties, uh, you know, certainly after I lost my virginity, um, if I was lonely, if I was, um, depressed, if I experienced anxiety, if I wasn't happy with myself, whether it was in sports or school or whatever, right. I would, um, sort of lose myself in sexual relationships, meaning like I would kind of stow little pieces of myself in different sexual partners under the guise of like, this is healthy. Like this is consensual. We're both just, it's just friends with benefits. And you know, it's, it's great. Right. They're having a lot of sex with different people, yeah. different women. And I think it wasn't until, um, you know, a really big breakup, uh, in my thirties that sort of flipped a lot of different switches for me. You know, I went, I went back to therapy. I started really investing in a lot of different things about myself where I understood, you know, um, I don't really have a problem with a lot of substances at all, but I do realize that my addictive nature, which I do believe we all have, brain chemistry, is I was self-soothing in sex, meaning that like I wasn't being intentional about the people I'm having sex with. And I don't regret any of the experiences because they've definitely taught me who I am today. It's allowed me to grow into my sexual maturity, to be confident who I am, what I like, what I'm into, where I want to explore, where I don't, right? Um but I think it's important as a man to be really honest about the drive behind that, right? Because there's two things going on. There's the biological thing, which is the testosterone, all these other things that sort of tick within people. And it's like, okay, we, you know, I have this drive to like, uh, like mate or, or for instance, to have sex, right? That's a sex drive. Okay. That's innate. But then the consciousness and the soul, I would say, is what allows you to be the delineator or the captain of that ship and, and, and do what you will with that drive, right? And so if that drive controls you, if you're simply a subservient to your ego, to that sex drive, there really isn't much meaning behind it, right? It's controlling your soul. It's controlling your direction. It's controlling how you feel about yourself after, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's taken a lot of work and I'm still honestly consciously working on it where it's like, I want to be intentional with who I sleep with, why I'm sleeping with them, you know, that doesn't mean I have any less sex or any more sex, really. It just means that I'm conscious about what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. Right. Mm -hmm. 
And, and to go back to sort of the initial question of like the, where this ego stemmed from, I think it just really grows with, with, we're just traditionally fed. Like, this is how you should act and behave as a man, right? Yeah. This is how you can feel better about yourself. Like sleep with attractive, good looking women. I'm using a heterosexual relationship as an example, but this applies to homosexuality and non-binary as well too. It's just like, you know, do this, sleep with better looking people, feel better about yourself, and then continue to do that. Get in a relationship with a really good looking person. And then, oh my God, light bulb, just because you're good looking does not mean you have relational skills or intimate <laughs> skills to be, you know, functional over long term in the bedroom, right? Ding, 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 ding. Right. And, and this is this is why we run into issues in long term relationships because, God, when I see someone on the street, Dr. Tar, I'm like, well, that's a really good looking woman. Like, right. I wonder, like, you know, okay, like I'm attracted to her, right? And let's say we go on a couple of dates. We have great sex for the first six weeks. Let's say first six months, a year goes by, we're in a relationship and then the monotony kicks in, right? <laughs> and then that's where the ego, again, starts to grip hold. It's like, well, am I not attracted to my partner anymore? Is this really working out? And a lot of times, not all the times, but that's caused by a fissure in sexual intimacy, which is pretty much what you work on. Right? Yeah. So when you say ego, let's like clear that out. Like what how do you define yeah. ego? That's a great question. So I, I tend to take like Carl Jung's approach, but ego is, it's not, it's not something that's bad. I want to say that, right? It's right. just something that exists all times, which is sort of the unconscious mind or the animalistic mind that is um, predisposed by our genetics, but also our environment, right? Our childhood trauma, things we experienced, um, all the good and bad things, right? Mm -hmm. And so the ego is sort of manifested as a defense mechanism to kind of protect us from, uh, you know, um, death or being hurt, right? It's mm -hmm. kind of this little wall mm -hmm. and it serves purpose throughout our lives most of the time, right? Mm -hmm. But the soul is us. It's the, it's the thing, the energetic thing behind the ego. And the issue in, in most of our cultures is that now the ego has been brought to the forefront. Like, it's like, look at me, 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 right? Hyper-individualized. Whereas the soul is our sort of life force that connects all of us, right? So it's much more tapped into sort of meaning and true purpose versus pursuit, right? And so when I talk about ego, it's not really that I'm trying to bastardize ego. It's just that the ego is the unconscious that we need to bring into our conscious, you know, ability into the soul and kind of mesh them together. And I, and I, I describe it this way. It's a lot easier for people to understand is the ego is the surface self, meaning it's what we show people. It's, it's where society and presentation presentation is right. It's where our family, you know, we hear the voice of our mom and our dad or our sister and our brother, or our grandparents in our mind. It's that little voice. It's like, you need to do this because if you don't shame on you, or if you don't, you need to feel guilty or feel bad about yourself. And the soul is like your true sentient being that is existing, whether you realize it or not. And it, it's sort of the, the, the yolk inside of the egg, right. And the ego is kind of the shell. And, I, and in my mind, a healthy human being is, is, is porous. They're palliable, meaning that like they have areas where they can intersperse the ego and the soul together. And they're, they've sort of brought the surface self and the deep self, which is the soul together in alignment. Mm -hmm. So there's not like a, an, you're not like a perfect human being, but you don't feel shame. You don't feel guilt around who you are, what you're owning and what you're working on, right? Mm -hmm. There's a, there's a level of acceptance and the motivation to change that sort of exists in harmony when you do mm -hmm. that. Mm. Wow, I am a uh, that's a that's a great <laughs> definition. When I uh, thought about like just the term ego and without, you know, thinking too much or too in depth about it, I thought about ego being this like inflated self-importance. Yeah. Like that's certainly a part of it, right? Who is egotistical is someone who has an inflated level yeah. of sense of self-importance. That Right that person like is the most important person, person in the room, mm -hmm. the smartest person in the room, the best looking person in the room, or that's what you think. Right. Yeah. And I feel like to me, that's like when someone is being egotistical. Yeah. Um, so like when it comes to sex, I definitely think that the ego plays a big role um, in sexual init initiation and rejection, mm -hmm. especially when men are being rejected. Um, and if they're not, you know, connected with their soul, they're very angry. Uh -huh. Is yeah. that something you've explored? Uh, yeah, so much. And I, and I think that this, so I, I do believe women experience issues with rejection too. A, a lot of my clients are women and they, they tell me like they, they feel so bad about themselves and they're rejected. Or even, yeah. if someone, even if someone offers them rejection in a very compassionate way, being like, hey, you know, I really enjoy spending time with you, but I'm just not feeling a connection. I don't want to continue the pursuit of a romantic relationship, but I'd love to be friends, right? And a lot of times that just crushes us, men as well too. Yeah. Right? 
And an un, underdeveloped or unexplored ego, the response would basically be that of, I'm a victim, right? This person doesn't right, want me. I'm not good right. enough. I'm not good looking enough. My penis isn't big enough. I don't, I don't <laughs> have good enough sex, right? Whatever you want to throw. I don't make uh -huh. enough money. I'm not smart enough, whatever, right? Um, rather than saying like, look, this, this person is just simply saying, I'm not choosing you. There's 8 billion people on this planet. You know, honor yourself, honor your own soul while honoring their choice. And saying thank you and saying okay i'll move on to the next one now that's a different scenario than someone hurting you right and someone really just like breaking off with you in a really unhealthy way and in that response you know we do need the ego a little bit to protect us right we need to kind of shield ourselves because if we allow ourselves to continuously be spoken to in an unhealthy way that's called abuse right and so i right. think it's a fine line of being conscious of the ego and where you allow it to influence your life like for instance mm -hmm. pride right pride in the bedroom well i'm prideful because people tell me i'm really good at sex right and so mm -hmm. i walk around and then one person tells me hey that wasn't really good and then it just <laughs> boop, deflates me right yeah and that's kind of an unhealthy place the ego right but yeah. but if the ego sort of is interjected in there where it's like hey i have enough self confidence in my abilities where if someone says they're not really feeling it with me i'm not going to lose a sense of self i just honor that i wasn't a good match for them and it's okay right. because i've had plenty of other good experiences right mm -hmm. And some people are just not sexually compatible. You can do a lot of work to be sexually compatible, no doubt about it, right? But some people just never get there because they just, one has too much trauma or they just, you know, they want different things, attracted to different things, right? Um, but I think just understanding the ego allows you to be a little bit more fluid with judgment, right? It allows you to be a little bit more fluid with the understanding of self and the understanding of another, and that directly relates to sex, directly relates to intimacy, which is sort of the, the you know, the power behind sex, right? Because mm -hmm. the more safe you feel and the more intimate of connection you feel with someone, usually the greater the orgasms and the greater the sex you have with them. Mm -hmm. Wow. Uh, now that I'm thinking about it, ego and sex, they're like intertwined. Mm-hmm. Most definitely. Uh, yeah. So, okay. So to recap, first you talked about the ego exhibiting itself as like for most young men having unconscious or unintentional sex, the more sex you have, the better, because that, that's just a good look. Right. And then you, uh, the second point where the ego exists is the ego within the bedroom where you're like being rejected or when someone gives you a negative feedback of some sort that like, mm -hmm. oh yeah, like I didn't come or like that wasn't, that wasn't so good. Right. Uh, then the ego can play a negative um, can exhibit negatively like, well, fuck you then. Maybe you weren't good. <laughs> or positively like, hey, I'm confident in myself. And you know what? Maybe you and I are just not the right person for each other. Or maybe tell me more. Like yeah. I can definitely get better. And right. Exactly. Yeah. And I think that that last point kind of leads into, you know, one of the, the biggest issues to having ego in the bedroom is you don't talk about sex outside of the bedroom, you right. know? And and we live in, and I, this is why I love you and your content is because you're normalizing, like just talking about your key, your, your kinks and your freaks and all these other things. And I don't say that in a, in a, in a judgment word at all. It's just like, you know, what you're into as you grow more into a full self, it's easier for you to just talk about it. You right. know what I mean? Right. Like, you know, when I was, when I was in my early twenties, uh, there were some things I was into and I was just kind of like, oh yeah, I, don't, I probably shouldn't say that, you know? <laughs> and, and now I'm just like, no, it's just like who I am. Right. And, and of okay, course, now I'm else, so curious. What are, what are the things you were into that you were like, so, I don't know about sharing. <laughs> so, all right, I'm going to get super personal here. Let's do this. <laughs> um, so I think like, dude, I've always been, a, a, an ass guy, you know, I think uh -huh, I grew up uh -huh. in a Hispanic community. So sticking uh -huh. my face in an ass. Whew, let's go. A nice, yes. a nice one. Okay. Yes. And I'm talking superficial here, everyone. Just let, let like, like stay with me here. But I think even talking about like, oh, I like to like eat a really good looking chicks, but you know, yeah. like, I think, I think it was more taboo like 10 years ago. Ass eating? Yeah. It, huh. it, talking about it, talking about oh, it. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And, and I know this isn't like something crazy, right? This, you know, everyone has different variations of stuff, right? <laughs> Um, you know, I, I've certainly like sucked a few toes in my life. Uh -huh. I've, you know, I've, I've done, you know, a whole host of things. Like I, I enjoy very athletic sex, for instance, for instance. So a lot of my sexual partners are usually like very athletic themselves, you mm. know? Um, but these are all my preferences. Right. But I think when I was younger, you know, instead of even talking about it, I would just like engage in sex. Right. Uh -huh. And so the sex was like quite unconscious versus like, if, if I had connection with the person and we were having coffee or lunch or dinner, I'd be like, Hey, what are you into? 
You know, like, what do you like? And then let me talk about what I like. And if there's some misalignment here, it's cool. We don't have to like, like for, for instance, one thing about me is like, I'm an absolute pleaser. And, I, and, I, and I'm going to relate this back to my, my friend, Jillian Tarecki, who had on my show. Um, she had this wonderful quote a couple months ago. And it was, if you're a giver, find another giver to love. Right. And that, that's, been oh, one sweet. Main, that's one of my main things in life is that I'm an absolute giver in the bedroom. And what really turns me on is actually pleasing my partner, mm -hmm. pleasing the, the woman I'm with. Right. I don't know if I can't speak for every man, but I do know a lot of men that are like that. And so if I'm into something, but it like doesn't turn her on, it's actually not going to turn me on. I got to be honest. Mm -hmm. Right. So like, for instance, going back to those things I just mentioned, like if that doesn't turn the woman on, I'm probably not going to be turned on doing it. Mm -hmm. You know, and so it is about finding someone that's in sexual alignment with that. That is mm -hmm. in that, that the things I'm into turns her on and the things she's into turns me on. And then fucking hey, let's have at it. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, that sounds awesome. You know, mm -hmm. no holds barred kind of thing. Um, and I think that I've really grown into that, you know, as, as a man, as I've matured, not only emotionally, physically and mentally, but sexually. And, and all those things kind of have to mature together, right? Because mm -hmm. if you like you, if you don't work on your emotional health, your emotional side of understanding and relationships, sex is not going to be able to follow suit really well, right? Because mm -hmm. sex is an emotional act, right? There's emotional connection. It doesn't always have to be overly attached, right? Um, I don't have any problem with people having, you know, random sex or sleeping. Mm -hmm. No, no judgment there at all, but there still is a, a gravitas behind the connection, the energy, the energy we transfer, right? We'll sleep mm -hmm. with someone. Mm -hmm. And so I think if we can be more open about what we're into, you know, and I'm certainly open to explore too, right? Like um, I've been asked to have threesomes by some women with other men and I'm just not into men, you know, it's just, I'm, I'm just not. So it's just not my jam for other people. It is then and, and totally cool with them, but it's also about knowing what you don't want to do too, right? There's just some things I'm not attracted to. Like it doesn't turn me on. Right. And that's just some of my innate biology and my innate, you know, experience too. Now, that doesn't mean I'm not down to explore other things with my partner, but I am sort of a, you know, one woman kind of dude, right? That's just, that's just what turns me on. Other people, they want to have sex with multiple people. That's freaking awesome for them too, right? But I think the thing is, is like, don't, don't, you have to work on the shame around what you're into and why you're into it. Understand yourself and then mm -hmm. share that with someone else. But in order to share it, you have to have a safe space, right? Mm -hmm. You have to have someone that's able to like listen to that and not be like, oh my God, it's fucking weird. You know what I mean? Right. Because that, that just doesn't feel good, right? Yeah. So to recap, the third point you were talking about in terms of how ego manifests itself in a sexual, in a sexual realm uh, for all of us is through communication or the lack thereof. Mm -hmm. Because of the if when the ego is too big, you may not want to communicate about sex outside of actually having sex because perhaps you're afraid of rejection, afraid of differences, afraid of bringing up arguments and conflict. Um, but when it is projected positively, it can be like this energetic uh, experience between the two people, right? Because you're speaking yeah. about being a very generous lover. And I think you were speaking about it very confidently in a way that that's a part of your ego. Right. Exactly. Uh, so, exactly. and then the fourth point you were talking about, and I want to probe about this is when you were saying, you know, the, um, it, whatever people are into is what they're into, but also knowing your boundaries of what, what you're not into. Now, my question is, what is, what is the difference between ego, um, and boundaries. For example, I'm going to give you like a specific scenario that happens to a lot of women. Yeah. Heterosexual couple, right? The man's like, oh yeah, totally down for threesome. Yes, let's go. As long as it's man, uh, fee MFF, male, yep. female, female. Exactly. But when the woman's like, no, like I also want to try, I, I'm totally down to do that, but I also yep. want to try uh, MFM, like man, mm -hmm. uh, male, female, male. Yep. And the, usually the guys are like, oh no, absolutely not. I'm not into guys. So to yep. me, that's ego. Yeah. So it is ego, but it's also sexuality, right? Uh -huh. And so like, it's okay if another man doesn't want to be naked next to another man, if that doesn't make them feel comfortable. It's okay mm -hmm. if another woman doesn't want to be next, naked to another woman and have sex with her, if that doesn't make her feel comfortable. She's not attracted to it, right? So here's my thing. In that scenario, it is totally up to the man to be like, look, if, if, you're, if I'm not attracted to another man and you want that, like it's not equal, right? And, and this is a relationship. So therefore, unless your partner is okay with just having sex with another woman, right? And not bringing another man into it, that's fine. But, it, but if she wants it to be equal and you're not okay with another man, then you probably don't engage in those acts, right? To stay, to stay fair. And there is, there is a, 
uh, um, an amount of consent, consent that goes into that, right? Like I'm okay with knowing that I don't want to have sex next to another dude. I have mm -hmm. no problem saying that, right? Mm -hmm. It's not homophobic. It's not any sort of phobia. It's just like, I'm not attracted to men. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm attracted to women. Um, could I have a threesome, an eight sum, a 10 sum with women? I don't know, probably, uh -huh. but does that really turn me on? No, because there's something about one, a one person connection where we can you know, be, be ourselves and let go, you know? Um, and, and to, to the same extent, if I had a partner where it, like, hypothetically, if I was like, oh, I really want to bring another woman into this sexual experience. And she was like, okay, well, let's bring another man in. I'd be like, all right, well, I'm actually not okay with that. So even if you're, even if you're okay with this, it's probably not fair for me to, uh -huh go this route because I don't, you know, you, you don't get the other end of the coin here. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? And so I think it's really important to be conscious about that. Now you asked, is that ego? And I think, you know, there's a fine line between like your sexual preferences is an ego because people are like, well, you've never tried it. How would you not know? Uh -huh. And I'm just like, look, sweetheart, I know I'm not attracted to men. You know, it's just, it's just like, I, I can't do anything about it. It's like telling someone who's homosexual, well, why can't you just love someone of the opposite sex. Uh -huh. It's like, Hey, they, they have their sexuality, right? They're allowed uh -huh. to love and have sex with who they want to. That's part of them being a sentient being, right. And uh -huh. making that choice. And I respect and honor that. And I have reverence for that. And that's different than like your trauma preventing you uh -huh. from experiencing something new. Uh -huh. Right. And I think the only way to delineate that is to do some really deep soul searching. Like why don't, why doesn't this turn me on? Okay. Well, I'm just, it just doesn't like, I'm just not attracted to it. Right. Uh -huh. Versus did something happen in my past that has shut a door for, through for experience, right? And in my case, it's not the case. So, you know, for me, I, I just know my sexual preferences, right? But I'm also I'm also very fair. Like I don't I don't believe that I should get something that my partner doesn't get in return, you know, unless she really unless she really wants to give that or she really turns her on. Mm -hmm. Right. So what happens if it's not about your attraction to another man? What happens mm -hmm. If let's say your long-term girlfriend is like, hey, listen, Nico, it's always been my fantasy. It's always been my dream to have a threesome with yeah. you and another man. And this yeah. would be a birthday, a present, a yeah. gift that I'm asking you to do. So yeah. it will be you, another man having sex with her. Yeah. Um, what would you say to that? So, you know, I, I probably wouldn't be in a relationship with a partner because we would talk about that beforehand, you know, cause I'm uh -huh. very sexually open and I'm just yes. not into it, you know? So I'd say, sweetheart, I, I realize that's a fantasy of yours. It's something that I'm not willing to contribute to because it doesn't okay. turn me on. Right. Okay. And so I won't self-sacrifice mm -hmm. just for someone else's pleasure. Okay. Mm -hmm. It has to be mutually beneficial. And I do a lot of things in the bedroom where I want to, you know, pleasure my partner, mm -hmm. but I don't believe in losing a sense of oneself and being mm -hmm. uncomfortable, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, um, there are certainly edges, you know, I love to, to play with in my own sexuality, but I do have my own boundaries, right? Just like women do. If I, if I were to go to her and be like, Hey, sweetheart, I really want to sleep with my woman and have a, an incredible threesome. And she's like, I don't want another vagina around me. You know, I don't want to be around another naked woman. I'd be like, okay, I honor that. I still love you. You know what I mean? Uh, there, there's some things in relationships that take sacrifices. And at that point, you can either decide if that's a deal breaker as a couple, or if that's something that you, you don't talk about or you don't bring up. Right. But I do believe we should discuss it. I absolutely mm -hmm. believe someone should bring it up. I just think it should happen sooner than later. You know, yeah. so you can, you, you can see if you're sexually compatible. Right. So that's what I yeah. mean. I would never have that conversation with a partner because we would have it in the first couple of dates. You know? Right. Cause I'm yes. like, let's talk about sex. What are you into? Like, do you, are you into sleeping multiple people? Do you, yeah. go to, you go to sex parties, you go to orgies, you know, um, you know, I have, I have friends uh, that I know quite well that go to parties. It's just, it's just not my jam, you know, but I totally respect theirs. And I li and we talk about it, their experiences, you know, it's wonderful to hear as well. Yeah. So I think the thing is like women ask for their boundaries to be respected and men's boundaries need to be respected too. Right. And the thing yeah. is both boundaries need to be respected. And so I am all about honoring my partner's wants and fantasies to the place I'm comfortable with. Right. Mm -hmm. And and if, and if sexually I can't provide that, then maybe she should find someone that can, if that is really a deal breaker for her. Now mm -hmm. I know that although that fantasy might be a big thing, if we're compatible in all these other places, meaning we still have great sex, we still are open in a lot of ways. We have great communication, emotional connection, intellectual connection. In my mind, I'm like, well, I wouldn't really want to throw a relationship away mm -hmm. just because of that one fantasy. But if it's, if it's, you know, big enough to her, maybe, maybe she does, maybe she needs mm -hmm. someone else. Right. And that's an important consideration to make. Yes. Yes. Uh, what about the ego about sex toys? Oh man, I love this question. So this is, you know, it's funny. I, I, I did not use a single toy until I was 31 years old, so that was, that was a year ago, <laughs> you know? And, and I had, a, and like I said, I had a lot of sex in my twenties. Uh -huh. Right. Um, now I will say that a lot of the women I had sex with 
I'm sure they had toys, but they never brought it up, right? It was never like, hey, use this on me. And I think, again, the issue is twofold. Like a lot of younger women were scared to bring it up because maybe they thought it would hurt the guy's feelings, right? Because, because like, oh, this guy can't make me come. Right. So I'm going to bring out, you know, the rabbit 8,000 out here. And he's, <laughs> he's, he's just going to be like, well, what do I do with this thing? It's like a, uh-huh. it's like a game controller, you know? And, <laughs> and now, you know, it's, it's funny as I've grown in again in my sexuality, it's really about pleasing my partner and again, being pleased, you know? And, Mm -hmm. and I really don't have ego around if I'm, if I have, if I have to, if I'm able to make my partner come just with my own body, you Mm -hmm. know? And, and a lot of times that happens over time. So as we get to know our partners and where they're, where they're points of like, you know, being turned on, where their sensitive Mm -hmm. spots are, we can make them, we can, we can honestly learn how to make them orgasm, right? And we can work together. It's a synonymous work together thing, right? It's not just like one person's fucking the other. It's like, you're fucking each other guys, right? Mm -hmm. It's a a tag team. Mm -hmm. If it's just two people, not more. Right. And so in that, like me reframing, like, you know, when I, when I, when we brought in toys for the first time, it was someone um, I was having sex with. It was just like this, like blossoming experience where I'm like, this is fucking awesome. Mm -hmm. Like this, this woman's coming all over the place. Mm -hmm. She feels incredible. She's so much less stress. You know, we had great, (laughs) we had a great conversation after the sex, you know, and I'm like, the thing is, is a lot of men have an aversion to using a dildo or using a, a toy or a vibrator or, or a cock ring or whatever have you, because for some reason it, one makes them feel less like a man or it makes them feel less straight. And they like really like rigidly held on to being straight. And I think, look, if you are straight, okay, you know, you're straight, right. But that doesn't do, have to do anything with the toys you use, mm-hmm. right. The toys you use don't define your sexuality, mm-hmm. like who you're having sex with does. Right. Mm-hmm. And so like if you if you want to try new things a great way to do that is to bring in toys and shop with your partner like mm-hmm. you know or buy it as a gift but mm-hmm. in my mind if you've never used the toy with your partner i would always say like check with them first cuz they might not feel comfortable with something right and again it's about consent for both of you and so i think one of the, the hottest things to do whether you're dating someone or in a serious relationship is just like hey get on like a sex toy shop, go to a sex toy shop in person or get on Amazon and just like look at shit, giggle together, order some stuff and go to town, you know, mm-hmm. make sure you order a lot of lube. You're going to need that too. And, uh, you know, have fun. Like, I think the thing is, and we talked about this when you were on my show is you talked about curiosity a lot, right? Mm-hmm. And curiosity is sort of the antithesis or the antidote to a very strong ego. You know, when you're egotistical, you're really rigid and you're just like, oh, no, 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 I can't do anything because it's going to make me feel weird. Right. Um, And again, it's different than boundaries. But if I'm curious about pleasuring my partner and I really want them to feel good, why not bring in something else? Why not get like a a sex swing or, you know, I don't know what those things are called, but like those pillows that are like a triangle. Yes. You know, Um, like, like whatever the sex, sex mountains, Um, you know, there's a lot of different things you could get. I mean, think about like tying, tying someone up and talk about your fantasies, right? You brought up the the threesome thing, but a lot of women and men have other fantasies that don't involve other people, Mm -hmm. right? Some people want to be tied up. Some people want to be submissive. Some people want to be dominant. There's Mm -hmm. so many things, right? Some people want to get their face sat on, you know, like, just talk about it. Like, Mm -hmm. just talk about it. And, Mm -hmm. and also if someone's being honest with you about what they're into, don't shame them. Right. Don't judge them. Even if you're not into it, even if it makes you feel weird, just be like, oh, wow, that's, that's interesting. You're into it. And you can say like, I'm, I'm personally not turned on by that, but I don't like, that's, that's awesome. You know, um, it's okay I think to be using honest. like judgmental language about other people's sexual exploration is a reflection of themselves. Amen. Yeah. Amen. I, I can almost guarantee that the people that use judgmental language on other people are unhappy themselves. Happy people don't judge other people in a negative way like that. Right. And, yeah. and I would say that truly confident people, meaning like self-confidence or self-aware, truly mm-hmm. aware people don't judge sexually either. Because like, for instance, I know I don't want to yeah. like have a threesome with another dude, but I had friends that have, and I don't judge them at all. I'm like, dude, fucking, fucking yes for uh-huh. you. If that turns you on, go at it, homie, uh-huh. you know, like do your thing, like have fun with your partner, you know? Um, and it's the same thing I think about with polyamorous and, mm-hmm. and ethically non-monogamous relationships, sexual relationships, right? Like I know that's not for me, at least right now in my life, it's just not something that I, like I think was going to work well for my life. Next time we talk, you're like 50 and you, you're in like an eight people relationship. <laughs> living, living in like a commune in Oregon. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, but I just don't, I have clients that they're in that and friends that are in those relationships. And I'm like, if it, if it, as long as it's healthy and it's contributing to your life and mm-hmm. the lives of other people and you feel like you're growing and, mm-hmm. you know, and just, it's good for you. Good. Right. Good, yeah. You know? Yeah. I'm all about people being happy. Me too. It's like, why would we be here? 
Like, you know, living, that, like living and being happy. It's like the, like why we're here. That is the thing. It's, it's interesting because we live in such a death phobic society, right? And one of the <laughs> things I like to talk about a lot is death. Because uh -huh. ladies and gentlemen, as soon as you're born, you are dying. Congratulations, mm -hmm. right? You are on the merry-go-round that you will get off eventually, right? And no matter what you think about what happens after, and this, I'm going to bring this back to sex, is that you are dying, right? And so you could <laughs> die today, you could die tomorrow, you could True. die when you're 80 or 90. So why are you not going to try to experience the most beautiful, like embodied sex life you can mm -hmm. and share that with someone that's important to you? Right. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the, the argument, exactly. I know the argument will be brought up. Well, like, why don't I just go fuck everybody? Right. Because right, it's just like right, right. all this love. Which and I'm like, a mindless argument. <laughs> there we go. That's, that's it. It's mindless. Right. And so that's your sort of innate animalistic behavior taking control, which is like be intentional and thoughtful about your curiosity. But oh my God, please, Jesus, go be mm -hmm. curious. You know, go try new things. Go, if you're in a relationship, if you're in a marriage, if it's been 20, 30 years, talk to your partner, be like, Hey babe, like, what do you think about ordering this? And like, or, or, or going here, you know, on, on a Saturday and, you know, like do different things, try different things. And I guarantee you that's not only going to improve your sex life, it's going to improve your actual life outside of sex. You're mm -hmm. going to, you're going to be more in love with each other. You're going to be a little calmer, a little more forgiving, a little more patient with each other because you feel good about each other. Mm -hmm. Oh, amen. And that, so to recap, that fifth point was about the ego, about the toy in the bedroom. And as a woman who has had a lot of sex and, you know, who work with a lot of women who have a lot of sex, uh, <laughs> we can guarantee it does not substitute our partner. If anything, it enhances the experience altogether. Yep. Amen. Uh, just because I bring out a vibrator when you doggy style me, it doesn't mean yeah. I forget you. You're literally inside me. I am not forgetting you. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, it's funny because anyone that talks to me, if they're having like sexual stuff in their relationship, I'm like, you need to go watch Dr. Tara's stuff. You know, you need to go, you need to go because you just have such great stuff. But it, it, I just want to throw up a little bit of anecdotal experience. So uh, one of the dildos I use, the woman I was sleeping with is literally the size of my arm. You know? <laughs> It's, it's 14, it's 14 inches. It was like two and a half inches wide. I mean, your, your jaw is dropping. And when I, when I, I was like, holy shit, dude, if this is on someone, <laughs> they are definitely not running a marathon. You know I mean? Fucking I dude. This, this looks really painful to have on your body. I gotta be honest, but bless that all you guys out there. Painful. It does, but you know, Hey, so I, it's like, it wasn't, you know, for her at least. And, and, but the thing is, it's like, it didn't make me feel any less of a man. Like I don't have a 14 inch penis, you know, I'm proud of what I got. I love mm -hmm. my body. I love what I have. Um, you know, but it, it didn't like, it doesn't like hurt my ego to right. use that. Whereas when I was 20, 22, I probably would have been like, I can't touch that, you know? Right. Like, yeah. That's gay. <laughs> yeah. It's, 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 it's a rubber thing, you know, that came right. from a factory that got poured somewhere. Right. I mean, right. you know, it's so. I know it, it, that I, narrative I just, is so bullshit, but then right. it's so common. It young, is very common. young guys. Yeah. The, the other thing that's really common, and I hope it's okay, I, I just dropped this in, is that when people feel bad about masturbating when they're in a relationship, that yeah. comes out a lot. And that, that oh, also is that's ego. another thing. Yes. Right. It's like, guys, you, it doesn't mean you don't love sex with your partner and men and women. It doesn't mean like you don't, you don't have, it's just like, sometimes you just want to pleasure yourself. And, and, it, and you can talk about it in a relationship. You know, one of the hottest things is like, you know, let's say like your partner's at work or something and you, you masturbate whether you're a man or a woman and you like text them like, Hey, I just came super hard. Can't wait for you to get home. Something yes. like that. Like, that is such a hot thing to share versus mm -hmm. like, what, why do you have to masturbate without me? I should be enough. It's like, dude, you know, like we're here to pleasure each other. And yeah. I am really happy if my partner like, you know, does some work on herself and she like feels better. It's like she had her little meditation session and yes. she, you know, like fucking came three times, like hell fucking. Yeah. I know I'm going to get home and, and feel better about how she's feeling too. Mind you, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm speaking, you know, metaphorically here. I don't have a partner, but this is, <laughs> but this is what I think, you know, should be, this is what right. I think embodies health, you know? Right. Wow. Okay. So point number six, ego and masturbation. Yeah. Uh, especially in a relationship, mm -hmm. especially that, because right. when you're single, you can masturbate every single day, like it, multiple times a day. But when you're in a relationship, it becomes taboo all of a sudden. Exactly. Yep. And, uh, do we have time for one more point? I know. Yes. I know okay, cool. Yes. Uh, I wanted to just talk about porn a little bit because, uh, you know, I was first exposed to porn when I was 13 years old, 12 or 13, right? Um, right when the internet was like actually a functional thing, you know, um, before, it, like before it was just Pong and now it's like <laughs> emails and there's videos. I remember. Online, right? 
Right. Exactly. And, and I, you know, I remember being exposed to it and then that's where I learned all my sex ed from. I'm like, Oh, this is how you have sex. Like, this is what they sound like. This is the, what you sound like. This is what happens. Right. And it, and it's just like, um, a reenactment or, or a Hollywood esque. you know, everyone's wearing makeup. You know, yeah. even if you look at the actors and actresses, right. As soon as they take their makeup off, they look like different people. <laughs> they look like normal human beings, right? Uh-huh. Um, and so I think the thing with that is, is we have to be really careful about how we communicate to our children and how we feel about ourselves with our interaction with porn, right? I think women and men have uh, biologically a little bit different of a response to pornography. I think um, men can get addicted far quicker, like very quickly. And I, and I do believe, like we talked about this in porn addiction, um, you know, because I think a lot of men, if they don't smoke weed or if they don't drink alcohol, if they have a bad day, if they feel stressed, what do they do? Well, they go on Pornhub and they'll watch porn for 30 minutes or an hour or three or four hours, right? And a lot of times I noticed, yeah, I know. I noticed that I would do this when I was younger, when I when I felt really down, you know? And when I, even if I was stressed out, let's say I had a good day and I was fucking stressed, right? I would do that. And, and once I started to sort of, um, again, observe myself, trying to practice self-awareness, I was like, when am I doing this? Well, I'm doing it when I don't feel good. And it's it's becoming an addictive thing, Right. And so now like I'm really intentional. If I do use porn, um, I honestly prefer having sex with real people. I gotta be honest, everybody. Um, But if if it is your thing, I would just say, be mindful of the ego's attachment to why you're using it, right? Mm -hmm. Because if it's not feeding your soul, meaning if it doesn't, if you don't walk away feeling better about yourself and feeling like more sexually empowered, it's probably not good for you. Mm, No, it's not. And yeah, like once a while, totally cool, man. But like every single day and some people multiple hours a day, I mean, you could be using that time socializing, getting, exactly, you know, feeling more connected to a friend or someone else or go on a date or hang out with your children, right? Right. (laughs) Uh, call your mom. (laughs) Ordering a sex toy. All right. Ordering a sex toy, anything at all. Okay. So that was 0.7 was the ego and the porn addiction. And, you know, research uh, from Gary Wilson and RIP, he died recently. Uh, He researched your brain on porn. Mm -hmm. And the brain, uh, the part of the brain that activates when you have porn addiction is it's almost exactly the same as people who have gambling and substance abuse addiction. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like you said before, drinking alcohol excessively, right. Or, um, gambling, like they're both addictive behave, like addictive things. And it's kind of like men will have to like find a way to get rid of this, like energy that they experience. And I know that a lot of people resort to exercising. Uh, Is that something that you usually recommend people when they're like, I can't just get rid of porn. Like I watch it every day. What do I do? You know, that's a great question. And and as someone who was a, a, an exercise addict, because I was a professional ultra runner. So you were addicted to exercise. Addicted addicted (laughs) to exercising is it's, I think it can certainly be a very helpful thing to replace one unhealthy behavior with a quote unquote healthier behavior. But if we just like run our bodies into the ground, it's different, right? And I think I'll relate this to substance use disorder with like alcohol, right? Mm -hmm. You can start smoking, right? If you go to AA, drinking coffee, stop stop drinking alcohol, but smoking is probably still unhealthy for you, right? What really helps people is community, right? AA is one of the most powerful things, whether you're spiritual or not, because it engages you with fellow people that too have experienced, right? And there's not, there's no shame there. Mm -hmm. And so I think one of the biggest things with people that, um, you know, either think they have a problem with porn or have self-diagnosed themselves as addicted to porn is that there's this huge shame of going to a support group or reaching out to their partner Mm -hmm. because, you know, there's not a lot of support for it and there's more coming out. Right. But I would really say, uh, go find a support group, engage with other people who are struggling with it. And then you can have people that hold you accountable and also exercise and have Mm -hmm. other like do yoga breath work. Right. But I truly believe that Uh, addictions are not um, created in a silo, meaning that we become addicted because of the experience we have with other people and because of the, the, um, you know, the relationships we have, whether at a young age or an older age. And if we apply that same logic to porn addiction, therefore we need other people to heal too, right? We need other Mm. other people to help. And so I would much rather turn to someone that has more experience than me. Maybe they've been sober from using porn for five or six years. You know, how did they get there? I want to talk to them. You know, ah, beautiful community, man. It's healing. Yeah. Amen. And you're creating your community as well. You're part of it. Yes. I love it. You're a part of my community too. Well, Nico, before you go, I have to play a game with you. Let's do it. 
So this game is called 10 Quickies with Dr. Tara. And what I'll do is I'll give you a word and you just give me a response back. It can be a word, a sentence, a noise, whatever. Okay. Are you ready? I hope so. Okay. <laughs> it's usually a little naughty. Okay. <laughs> Number one, butt plugs. Yes. Number two, monogamy. Yes. <laughs> you can, how about you can't reuse your can't first reuse response? Sorry, sorry. <laughs> monogamy. Um, it's hard for me to even answer this. Uh, it's yes for me, but maybe for some other people, that's a hard one because I'm like, right. what word goes with that? Um, <laughs> it depends. I guess. <laughs> it could be a sentence too. Okay. Number three, threesomes. Ooh, curiosity. Number four, porn. God, these are hard ones, Dr. Tars. <laughs> okay. um, intentionality. Mm. Number five, lube. Always. Number six, anal sex. All about giving, haven't received for me personally. <laughs> <laughs> Number seven, sexual meditation. Ooh, thankfully you taught me this and it is something that I now recommend to clients and I've currently tried to implore myself while I'm not Ooh. in a relationship. So I know this is a long answer, but uh, I think this is something that we all should be doing. Yes. Love it. Number eight, sex parties. No experience personally, but for others, they seem very stoked about it. So to each their own in that regard, I think if you're curious, have at it. Number nine, sexual confidence. Developed over time by intentional curiosity and working through shame. Mm. And last but not least, and number 10, life coaching. Something that can either help you or hinder you depending on who's providing it and who they are. So mm. be weary and ask good questions, but there are certainly a lot of good life coaches out there. Do your research, right? Do your research. Thank you so much for hanging out with me today, Nico. Thank you so much for allowing me on your show and um, you know being open. Obviously, I haven't been on a show like this. Every time I come on, it's very like relationship and love. And with you, it's just like let's talk about butt plugs sex, sex, and porn sex, and sex. sex. And I'm like, I love it. I love it, man. This is it's such a big part of life. I'm an incredibly sexual human being, uh, as you are, and it's wonderful to share this conversation. I hope people get stuff out of it. I can feel it from your energy. I know you are a sexual <laughs> being. Uh, where can my love bites fam find you? Yeah. So Instagram and uh, the TikTok, which I just got on recently uh, at that Barraza boy, B-A-R-R-A-Z-A. And then Starve the Ego, Feed the Soul is the name of the podcast. Please go check out Dr. Tara's episode. Um, it's on sex, shame, exploration, wonderful episode, but that's available anywhere you get podcasts as well too. And then uh, I work with people and couples uh, one-on-one and you can find me at www.nicobarraza.com. I'll have all those links in the show notes for today. Thank you so much mm -hmm. again, Nico. Thank you so much. It's beautiful to see you. Thank you, my Love Bites fam, for listening till the end of the episode. Share this episode if it resonates with you. Send it to your loved ones. And per usual, have an orgasmic day. Thanks for listening. This was, this was Love Bites. Love Bites by Dr. Tara. Follow Dr. Tara on social media at lovebites.co. Have an orgasmic day.